All right, it's August 16, 2022, 7.35 p.m. I'm gonna call the meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Members present, John Keehan, Bob Shavick, Andy Marco, Doug Roberts, Rebecca Sanofsky, Joseph Hall, and myself. We're gonna start uh, tonight with continuation of public hearing PZ-22-10, zone change application R80 to STZ related to a zone change and concept plan application for section 12.54, subset B, Zero River Road, MBL 34009-0A to 34009-0B, and C, Owner Barini Circle Associates and Arlington LLC, applicant Thomas Cody. So we're gonna continue where we left off. What we're gonna do, we have the list of last time. So I'm gonna continue uh, where we left off there. Just wanna remind everyone, you know, you're gonna have time to come up, you know, speak, you know, tell us what you think of, uh, you know, the uh, the application. But just, you know, be respectful and uh, and that's all I can ask. And try to keep it down in the crowd so people can hear themselves and so forth. And uh, with that being said, uh, we get going. First up on the uh, list is uh, Kathy Demers. Kathy Demers. Good evening. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I just, um, were you calling my name because you would like me to be um, able to speak? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Demers from the Conservation Commission, and the Conservation Commission has provided a letter to Planning and Zoning, which I would just like to highlight a few things tonight um, so that the public can be aware of the Commission's concerns. Um, if people are interested, our letter is um, under public comment number five in the PCC file. Um, as you know, one of the stated Missions of the Conservation Commission is to participate in determining the utilization of the town's land areas through research, inventory, natural resources, and making recommendations to the town officials and regulatory agencies for the wise use of these resources. According to Connecticut statutes, the Conservation Commission may make recommendations to the town's planning and zoning commission related to any proposed land use change. With this in mind, the Conservation Commission has prepared and submitted a letter and uh, what we have done is because zone changes and development have the potential to impact the town's natural resources, open space and community character, we consulted the text and maps in the town's plan of conservation and development, just like the Planning and Zoning Commission will do regarding the zone change. We particularly looked at those areas that address conservation related strategies. These include chapter four, protection of natural resources, chapter five, preserve open space, and chapter six, maintain an enhanced community character. In chapter four, there's a stress um, by the POCD to protect surface and groundwater quality. The town should also preserve and protect watercourses and wetlands and their function. SDZ requirements um, that the applicants show watercourses and wetlands, wetlands on their concept plan. Our town GIS maps currently show that a stream is located in the southeast corner of the property 
but this is not depicted on the applicant's map. This stream runs for approximately 800 feet through the property and flows to a pond on a neighboring property, which then connects to Conant Brook, making this stream a tributary to Conant Brook. As, you, as many of you know, Conant Brook flows through um, Howell's Pond and then onto the Willimantic River. Our concern is that the proposed change in land cover from primar primarily forced to this large warehouse and expansive parking area with almost 49% impervious cover will increase stormwater runoff and reduce rainwater infiltration and groundwater recharge to this stream. It's also unclear at this point what the effect of withdrawing 30,000 gallons a day from a new well will do to the groundwater levels in this area and how that will affect the stream's base flow. What we're recommending to planning and zoning is that they have the applicant provide mapping of all water courses and wetlands, inclu including vernal pools on the property, so that these can be considered during the zone change review. We also suggest that the applicant consider providing a hydrologic review to identify how their conceptual stormwater management plan and the withdrawal of approximately 30,000 gallons a day from, from their well would affect groundwater recharge to the stream and any wetlands that are located on the property. POCD also stresses that the town should continue to protect steep slopes from development pressure because of concerns about erosion and sedimentation, which can affect water quality. There are uh, steep slopes that are located on this property and our commission has included a soils map with our letter that is entitled erosion hazard and it includes a table of all the soil types on the property and their erosion potential based on online data that is available from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Our concern is that the map indicates that 84% of the soils on the property have a severe erosion hazard rating and 16% have a moderate erosion hazard rating when left exposed. exposed. The extensive scale of the proposed development will require significant disturbance of these soils during construction, potentially increasing erosion and sedimentation, which adversely affect local surface water quality. The POCD also recommends the town should continue efforts to preserve areas listed on the Natural Diversi Diversity Database, also known as the NDDB, which is maintained by Connecticut Department of Environmental um, Energy and Environmental Protection. Our POCD map shows that a natural diversity database blob area overlies a significant portion of the proposed development area. According to DEEP, these DDNDDB maps show the approximate locations of endangered, threatened, and special concern species. The maps are intended to be a pre-screening tool that can be used during land use reviews to identify potential impacts to state listed species in areas of potential conservation concern. We suggest that the PZC request an NDDB review by DEEP to determine if a zone change and the proposed use could potentially affect any state listed species in important natural communities which could be on this site. The next uh, chapter that the Conservation Commission reviewed was chapter five, preserve open space. The goal here, the goal here is to preserve open space in order to protect important resources, enhance community character, and enhance the economy and the quality of life in Willington. The POCD open space map and town GIS show that the Northeast portion of this property of the applicant's property shares an approximate 2000 foot border with a 53 acre protected open space parcel currently belonging to the state of Connecticut. This is zone residential and it's part of Deep's Nyholm and State Forest. This portion of the state forest is undeveloped, provides wildlife habitat and is accessible to the public for passive recreation and hunting via a woods road that begins at the north end of Eldridge Mills Road which is located off of 320. Our concern is that the applicant's concept plan shows that separation distances between the state forest boundary 
and the trailer parking is as close as 35 feet to the boundary. Wellington zoning regulation 4.14.01, which is titled types of buffers states that regardless of landscaping, no non-residential parking area shall be less than 50 feet from the property line of any residentially zoned parcel. Our concern is this proposed, that the proposed landscaping near the boundary of the state forest will do very little to reduce the negative impact that this development will have on this public open space. Also, hunting in this portion of the state forest will become more restrictive because according to state statutes, it is prohibited to hunt with, shoot, or carry a loaded firearm within 500 feet of any building occupied by people. We strongly recommend that the applicant consider scaling back the height and size of the proposed warehouse building and parking areas to reduce force and soil disturbance and achieve at least the required buffer distances from the state forest boundary so as to have less negative impact on its value as public open space and wildlife habitat. The last chapter that the Conservation Commission looked at was chapter six in the POCD that talks about maintaining and enhancing community character. According to the POCD, character resources include some of the following, natural resources, perception of open space, historic resources, archeologic resources, farms and scenic features, including scenic views, forests, pastures, watercourses, gravel roads, and stone walls. During the last POCD update, residents participated in the process during workshops, and they used terms such as scenic, rural, quiet, and peaceful when asked to identify things in Willington they were most proud of. So I just want to note that as you've been we've been going through these public hearings, many people have been saying these same things. These are not new concepts or new ideas that people suddenly have decided they want for Willington. These were things that residents strongly uh, felt about when we were doing our POCD planning. And I know many of you on PZC now were also part of that process. The applicant's concept plan for a 1.5 million square foot warehouse would require extensive clearing and disturbance of one of Willington's forested hilltops, which is particularly visible when approaching from the west on Interstate 84, as well as from north on Route 32. Our concern that once complete, the proposed warehouse will likely be in operation 24 7, 365. Because of the round o clock, traffic and need for outdoor lighting in the loading and parking areas, this type of hilltop development will likely increase the noise and light pollution experienced by local residents and wildlife. Despite required shielded lighting and landscaping, this hilltop development will forever alter a ridgeline view, contribute to sky glow and diminish the quiet scenic rural character that residents identified as being important to them in the POCD. And one other thing that we looked at in chapter six <clears throat> on uh, the map, POCD map 6.1, historic resources, it notes that the northern and southern portions of the proposed property, <clears throat> excuse me, may contain archeologically sensitive areas. And we highly recommend that the PZC request the applicant get a screening review by the Connecticut Office of State Archeology span to determine if if there are archeologically sensitive areas located on the property. <clears throat> Just in summary, although the POCD does encourage business and economic development to be cited in areas close to Interstate 84, it also notes and stresses that during the preparation of the POCD, residents expressed a desire for appropriate economic development. The POCD vision statement also says that Willington must balance conservation and development. With this in mind, we recommend a few other things for POC, PZC to consider. Ask the applicant to identify how this zone change and concept plan are in alignment with the POCD's conservation goals 
and how it will effectively protect and or mitigate any potential adverse impacts to the town's natural resources, open space, and community character. We also would like to suggest that PCC members hold the site walk so that they, you can view the property's topography and natural features. It's really hard to just look at a, a, a drawing and to assume you know what's on the land. We think that it's real important to do a site walk. Lastly, we request that PCC consider getting an environmental review and impact statement to be prepared by professionals qualified to prepare such studies related to this zone change and proposed uh, plan. Thank you for your time and consideration. We trust you will weigh both the town's conservation and development goals when making a decision about this application. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Sorry, Kelly Moore.
Listen to that statement carefully. He cited the plan of conservation and development, which called out the area of these parcels as a possible area for developing business potential. The operative words here are business potential. The Planning and Zoning Commission, in conjunction with the Economic Development Committee last fall, designated a new zoning classification called SDZ, or Strategic Development Zone, whose purpose was to facilitate large-scale development. The 1.5 million square foot building assuredly qualifies as a large-scale development. Did the plan of conservation and development associate business potential with large-scale development? Tom concluded that this project is in alignment with the plan of conservation and development. Was the emphasis on this alignment with the POCD reframed the conservation part or the development part of the plan? You have to ask yourself if this cement deal, this gargantuan Godzilla, is appropriate for Wilmington, a small rural town that ranks 126 in size out of 169. Tom said that the annual tax revenue would be between $3.3 and $3.8 million. He explained that the net tax revenue was estimated to be between $2.4 and $2.7 million. But you have to ask yourself, how does tax abatement impact this amount of revenue? Jeff Fitzgerald explained the conceptual site design. He noted this was not a retail establishment and didn't need to be highly visible like a truck stop would be. Now I ask you, how do you buy the 1.2 million square foot Titanic structure? He added that the intent is that from River Road, someone viewing the property would be experiencing very little of what goes on in this site. But we are going to experience what goes on there with lights, noise, traffic, etc., imposing on our daily lives. Jeff explained the need to create septic and well systems to serve the site, and that propane tanks and water tanks for domestic water and fire suppression would be required. These needs are more readily addressed in suburban settings with city water and sewers. Colleen Byrne, a railroad safety professional from Solar Engineering, spoke to design, spoke to the design of the driveway and lot, the driveway and lot from the conceptual plan related to traffic. Tom Cody explained the driveway design and its purpose. We were told that the steep grade and accessing the warehouse necessitated a serpentine road design. At the informational meeting of the traffic house on July 13th, we were told that the traffic value into and out of the building and into and out of the facility would total 900 trucks and 1,500 cars. 2,400 vehicles over a 24 hour period is a rate of 1.66 vehicles per minute. An immense number, an immense and impressive number for sure. 1.66 per minute assumes the 24 hour period. Yeah. But the 24 hour period is a rate of 1.6 as impressive. One point six six per minute assumes that the twenty four hour, the twenty four hundred vehicle travel is evenly distributed around the clock. It assumes that the rate of travel up and down the driveway is not slower as the trucks contend with steep slope going up and truck speed slow down on the steep slope going down. It assumes that the entrance and exit of vehicular traffic is seen is seamlessly fluid. And not subject to interruption in order to accommodate road traffic. It assumes that time for snow plowing doesn't delay movement of trucks, or that truck speed is not slow to negotiate slippery driveway conditions. How would each of these assumptions work in reality? This proposal promises 500 jobs. But this static statement is myopic and fails to address the future of expanding automation and its impact on the on workers. Automation is replacing the workers at an ever-increasing annual rate. There will be 500 jobs available in 10 years. Will there be 500 jobs available in 10 years? 
in a facility that will be a permanent fixture in our town. From concerns individually expressed at these meetings, a disturbing pattern emerges as to the enormous, permanent, and negative impact such a structure will have on low income, its residents, and the residents of surrounding towns. There has been an evolution in the rural landscape of our town that has recently accelerated. The DA truck stop was built on Newton Road in 1990 after 15 years of controversy. More recently, FedEx built across the road from the truck stop. This year, on July 28, the Lux Travel Stop opened, across from the truck stop on the opposite side of the highway. This pattern of development will be exacerbated if this mega warehouse proposal is approved and may well be the tipping point for the industrialization of our area. It will set precedence for the direction the land is going to go and be an open invitation to potential future expansion of industrial growth. You have to ask yourself why do people decide to live in Wellington? I believe it is for the rural atmosphere that is rapidly disappearing from America's landscape. We are one town removed from being included, included in the listing of the much gallery last green gallery. Wellington's proximity to the University of Connecticut provides the townspeople with cultural opportunities and luxury general associated with cities without sacrificing our rural lifestyle. The applicant repeatedly stated that the location in our town is perfect due to the proximity of the highway. It is a perfect program. Normally, when a property is for sale, the owner has done soil tests for septic systems and lists the property for sale as building. In this case, the planning and zoning committee has asked to approve the zoning change in order for the site testing and evaluation of the appropriateness of the site for its intended use. Go forward. Let's assume that the commission approves this proposal and we are open, are we opening a Pandora's box? If test results prove that many modifications must be made to accommodate environmental and traffic related problems, the builder will probably submit petitions for these alterations. If the commission refuses to be now phase legal seats, ask some reason. There is little that I can add to the many thought provoking, well presented, and well researched arguments given to this commission. Certainly, a convincing picture emerges as to why this proposal is so wrong for our town. I am not opposed to economic development in Wilmington, but as they say in real estate, it's all about location, location, location. The topography of this particular site is ill suited for a 1.5 million square foot warehouse. The warehouse is overwhelming in size, and inappropriate, and is not in harmony with the environmental setting of the Wilmington. The size of this concrete intrusion is not compatible in our town with wells and septic systems. Given our drought plague summer and the upcoming impact of climate change, one has to wonder about the future fragility of our water supply from wells. In 1975, I moved to Wellington with a then, with a then population of 2,000. The running joke at the time was that the cows are under the people. We have since doubled our population but the serenity of this rural landscape still remains. In closing, I ask, is this warehouse design at 1.5 million square feet, the 15th largest warehouse in the United States, really appropriate for a rural town of 6,000 people? I ask that the commission consider the enormity of evidence for the negative impact of this proposal on the town, and I thank you for your time and listening. Thank you, Ellie. Up next, Jim Rupert. Thanks. We're going to have uh, 
Jim Bird, Daphne Schneider, Zafir Hussein, Mark Kim. Those will be the, those will be the next four. setting for our region, that, thousands, that hundreds of jobs will be created, and that this will be a boon for our small, quiet town. Then they say that the visibility from the highway will essentially be none, and that the uptick in traffic minimum. But it cannot be the largest building of its kind in the Northeast and be practically invisible, as they are suggesting. Not to mention that this is the best way to London um, is 32, and to Providence 190 through Stafford, um, to Springfield on 44, meaning that their suggestion that 84 is going to be the primary route for these particular vehicles coming in and out is um, unrealistic. Also during the presentation, the applicant talked about how, they will, how the arrival of this logistics center will create a lucrative business, potential business zone on 32, between the highway and Route 74. I wrote in my notes at that time, are they suggesting strip malls? Then less than 10 minutes later, it was mentioned that working with one large contract like this, rather than the hassle of several contracts, excuse me, several contracts and permits would be preferable for us in the town. It was even mentioned that strip malls are probably the kind of businesses we would be saved from having to deal with. They mentioned that the project would be entirely on the lot adjacent to the highway and that the second lot would be left untouched. But then, why change the zoning there? I cannot believe that the client would be willing to sign a legally binding contract to ensure that it's left alone or to donate the land to a land trust. I cannot believe that they would, that they would have the zone change and then leave it alone just because they said they would. An argument I've been hearing to invalidate the, our town people's rights to turn down this um, turn down this warehouse is that we just don't want it in our backyard. But that's not it. Yes, not our backyard, but also not any backyard. A building of this size should not be built anywhere. We are in the midst of a drought right now. Think of how much water this facility would suck from the groundwater supply. We just had a heat wave. Imagine the heat and the pollution created by the trucks and the lack of trees in that area. It will scorch the surrounding land. They talked about our tax, their taxes being a whopping 14% of our annual revenue. But once they are here, will they threaten to leave if, and take the jobs if they don't receive any tax uh, relief? We thank you so much for planning the zoning commission. We vote for you and trust that you have the well being of the townspeople and our best interests at heart. And this is not it. This is not the plan. This has been rushed. And this, um, we, we, my family moved here four years ago. But before that, we had been looking at homes um, in the years that you guys were fighting the, the shooting range. We did not look for houses in Lincoln at that time. There are families who are watching this decision to see if Wellington is a place that they can consider a home or a place that they'll cross off their list of potential homes. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Catherine. Linda Roberge. I'm trying to swap out the mic. That's about the only thing I can do. Linda Roberge. Zafir Hussein. Zafir Hussein, H-U-S-S-E-I-N. See him anywhere? Mark Kemp. Anyone on the line like that? James Marshall. James Marshall. Hi guys, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. So sorry. Um, yeah, hi, James Marshall, 46 Fisher Hill Road. Um, given the audio issues, I did sign up last meeting in person. If I might request of the commission, am I able to defer speaking until the next meeting? Should this be continued? I assume this is being continued. It might be. We'll see how far we get tonight. I would assume <laughs> so, though, at this point. If it's not, can you, can I request that you put me at the end of the list? If it's continued, I'd love to speak in person to you next meeting because the audio is awful remotely online here tonight. Okay, we'll leave you on the list. Thank you. I appreciate it. Janice Boardman. Janice Boardman. Christy Lee Banaka. Again, Christy Lee Banaka. Burweth Banaka. Rachel Cook. Donna Cook. Again, Donna Cook. Andrew T. Alaska. Lisa. 
Peyton Brennan. Benson Chan. Can you guys hear me? I'm surprised we haven't gotten a Ferris Bueller yet. I was waiting for that. Maybe, maybe next person. All right, thank you. Thank you for not letting me down. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk plainly, but I want to thank all of the townspeople. Sorry, Benson Chan, uh, I live in 40 uh, Laurel Drive. Um, want to thank all the, the people who have spoken and spoken out against this project. Um, I think they did an incredible job researching everything, but I want to kind of talk plainly. Uh, my wife and I moved here a couple of years ago. We now have a one-year-old daughter. Um, we're planning on having a growing family. What we love about this town is a small town ambiance. That, that, that's it for us. We love this. I grew up in Granby. My, reminds me of that. Um, but plainly, this there's no doubt that the construction of this facility is going to be terrible for this town. Um, the emissions, the environmental concerns, uh, the traffic, uh, everything about this is not good for Willington and how our town is right now. Um, you know, with all due respect, data points, estimates that we've heard people present, um, every single data point can be kind of slanted towards making your argument. Um, I don't want to see us uh, make this uh, project happen. We have to say no. Um, the folks that are presenting, they have a job to do, but you know, no mistake about it. Every single company involved here is, to, is, is here to make money. And $2.5, $3 million sounds like a lot of money to you and me, uh, but for a company that uh, will inhabit a 1.5 square uh, million square foot warehouse. Um, that, that's a drop in the bucket. That's a percentage that's lower than the percentage we pay for our personal taxes. We can't be allured by a number that's big to people as individuals and think that that is a good deal for us. We just can't. Um, I've been in a million square foot warehouse. Uh, you can't see one end from the other end. It's insane. It's huge, it takes your breath away. That doesn't belong in Willington. Another thing that I worry about is uh, tenancy of, of this space, right? Fuel, fuel costs, distributors sometimes run on pretty thin margins. You know, what happens if gas prices go up? What happens if there's vacancies? Then we're stuck with this, you know, vacant warehouse. It's not something that we wanna have. There's no guarantees and just, at the end of the day, it feels like, you know, we're being asked to barter, you know, the best part of our town, one of the best parts of it, which is kind of its natural beauty, its ambiance. And, uh, you know, this is a bad deal for us, for tax money, that's non-guaranteed for the rest of the town. For growing families like my own, uh, we don't want this at all. Um, and, and lastly, I just, I wanna say to the town members, you know, we, we, we've got to keep our passion. We've got to be able to say no, and we've got to make this hard for this to happen. We have to hold people accountable, and we can't let um, this go to the next stage, because once it does, I think it's already done, right? We, we, we got to say no now, and I, I hope that, you know, uh, everybody is feeling that. Um, you know, I, I haven't met anybody that wants us. And so please just consider that this is um, the heart of our town. We're, we're bartering our future for some tax dollars. And uh, it just doesn't make sound like a good deal. It sounds like a bad deal. And I hope we all recognize that. Thank you for your time.
All right, this next name is a little hard for me to read the last name here. It's Anne Barnch Barnchelier. Or anybody, an Anne out there with a last name starts with a B, ending with an L I A R. Online, Mike? Gross Gene? Yeah, this isn't Gross Gene. All right, we'll go to Dave Tharp. Is he here tonight? He was last time. Donald Perizak. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for allowing us to speak here. I appreciate all your time and efforts. Uh, I'm speaking. Is this working? Okay. Donald Perzak, 70 Trask Road in Willington, Connecticut. Uh, I'm here uh, not representing my employer, the USDA, but I am a certified professional soil scientist and have been uh, mapping soils for over 30 years. Um, I'm an abutting property owner to this proposed project and have a number of concerns that I would like to uh, talk about this evening. Um, the parcel in question is essentially a, a large uh, hill or I would say almost a mountain. It's as a, at its core is a bedrock core. The shallow soils up there are very thin. Um, in many cases, there's bedrock outcroppings all over the place. Um, you know, there are areas where the soil is, you know, less than a meter thick. So this project and the slopes are exceptionally steep. And I know that for a fact, you know, I grew up in that area. I, I know it, that land intimately. Um, to, to create a project of this magnitude, it's going to be a, a very much a drilling, blasting, and leveling of that whole hillside to create, you know, any semblance of a level pad to put something of this magnitude out there. And with that comes a lot of risk uh, risk, everybody know, knows what the problems are with the uh, crumbling foundations we have here in this, in this area. Well, that same bedrock, the, the brimfield schist is underlying those brimfield soils, those nitmunk soils that are mapped out there. When you expose those, uh, those bedrock types, you're, you're basically starting a, uh, an acid uh, leachate problem. And I, I have a pond directly downstream from that proposed parcel with, in the stream, there are native brook trout downstream from that area. And these, this major project would very much threaten uh, the, the water quality of the stream and the pond that I have there uh, where we swim and fish. Um, so that, that's one of the concerns I have. Um, the other concern is, I noticed on the plan, they have um, areas where they plan to infiltrate stormwater. Many of those areas are presently on knobs of bedrock. They're located in areas of bedrock. You're not going to be able to infiltrate water into the areas that are bedrock. Bedrock is right, right below the surface in these areas. So where is this water going to go? It's going to run off somewhere. It's going to, you know, it's going to create problems down slope, whether it be, you know, towards the back, towards uh, Conat Brook, which is a direct tributary to the Hall's Pond over here, or, you know, out front towards uh, Route 32 or, or down towards Roaring Brook. Uh, I don't know if anybody was around back when they graveled out the section of uh, 
Route 32, way back when they were constructing, constructing I-84 at the time, but they took a lot of that gravel out. Uh, and to this day, there's a lot of wet seeps that come out of that hillside and the Connecticut DOT had to put some drainage to, a, to uh, address those problems. That problem's only gonna get worse. You put more uh, impervious surfaces on that hill slope, you gotta get rid of that stormwater uh, somewhere and you can't necessarily infiltrate it into that bedrock. It's really not gonna be uh, a feasible plan. Um, <clears throat> Section 12.15 of the uh, Plan of Strategic uh, Development Zone states a low impact development techniques. I would, I would say that this is clearly not a low impact development technique. Blasting a hillside down to create a level pad is not a low impact uh, development that fits in with the landscape. Uh, cl clearly it is not. Um, it, it talks about in the 12.15.9 uh, states existing topography and vegetation shall be uh, preserved and incorporated to the maximum extent possible. Is this really in keeping with that uh, strategic uh, zone regulation? I would say not. It, it really is not. It's a total uh, rework of the topography. Uh, and that you saw that sinuous road uh, that was, you know, proposed. The reason for that is they need to gain a lot of elevation and they want to minimize the steepness of that driveway. So they have to have all these switchbacks in there. Um, they may talk about, you know, it's proximity to the highway. It's very close to the highway, but not all land is created equal. This is not uh, Windsor or um, you know, Ellington or Manchester where you have these large flat sand plains. This is bedrock. There's gonna be a lot of drilling, a lot of blasting. Uh, I have a well just down slope from there. I wanna know what the impacts are gonna be to my well. Is it gonna impact my water quality? Is it gonna you know, diminish the amount of water I'm gonna have available? Um, is it going to impact my pond downstream? I, those are very important questions that I, I need to have answered. Um, the, the property values can only be negatively impacted by a project of this magnitude. Uh, it's, it's definitely not going to uh, help improve our property values at all. It's, it's, it's going to be a negative drain on, on services and you know this the quality of life will uh, diminish um, based on anybody driven by you know down through New Jersey where all the warehouses are it's a caucus area it's it's not a pleasant sight the traffic the noise the trash it, it all adds up and the quality of life is is drastically diminished and, you know I cut I come at this uh, you know, as a lifelong resident of the town of Willington, and I'd like to see, you know, the Planning and Zoning Commission take a long-term approach and not be stray, strayed by, you know, some quick tax dollars. Uh, you know, you gotta take a long-term approach as to conservation and development. What do we want the town to look like in 50 or 100 years? You gotta, Think, think long term and not necessarily the short term uh, gain of tax dollars. And I, I thank you each and every one of you for your time and your efforts that you put on the committee here. And you have a, a, a very important job ahead of you. And I, I commend you on your, your efforts here. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Paul Hipsky, Jr.
uh, Paul Hipsky Jr., 150 Turnpike Road. So I had a lot of things that I was planning on saying, but most of them have been said and far better than I probably could have said them. So uh, I'll keep it very brief. I, I just think that from an impact perspective, as many have said, that the scale and the scope of this development is too large. And I think we have enough of this type of development already in town. Uh, my exit is the exit where the TA is and the FedEx is, and I'm a mile up Turnpike Road from that, and now where the Loves is. And um, I don't think we need more of this type of development in town. And uh, the, the size and scope of this is just huge. So I just wanted to speak out it, that I'm against it. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. This next one, it's another one where I'm going to have trouble reading the last name. It looks like David G. U. and then it goes into illegible for me, but uh, David G. out there somewhere. Good enough. And actually, I don't know anybody in this room, but you all know me because I live on 25 Hancock Road. So you drive by my house every week on your way to the dump. <clears throat> and I also want to thank you. I moved in here in 99. And when I started working on my house, and I really do take pride. I hope you all think that way because I love my home. Um, some people put notes in the mailbox about, you know, this house looks beautiful, you're doing a great job, just sweet things like that. And I knew that then this was where I wanted to live the rest of my life. So I've been here since 99. I don't have all, you know, the last gentleman said a lot of good things. I don't have all the documents and all the facts and all the figures. I'm gonna speak from my heart. Um, you know, I own the Snap-on tool business for almost 30 years. So automotive is my forte. I noticed like the back of my hand. Half of that presentation is BS, what's going to happen in a truck facility. And I'm kind of mad at myself because because I live on that street, I kind of kept neutral in the town. It's not for nothing. Half of the world is crazy. So I figure half of you guys are crazy. <laughs> so, so I live on the street you're going to buy every week. <laughs> so I just played neutral. I never got involved in the politics. Geopolitics, I could teach a class on. And if you haven't figured out, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're in big trouble. The last thing we need to do is put this project together. But I'm angry at myself because while I was sleeping, I woke up one day and you guys are building a truck stop across from the other truck stop. <laughs> now, I live one mile from there. So let me tell you experience of what this is. And I moved in when the truck stop was already there, FedEx was already there. So it's, that was what I expected. But that presentation that they're gonna go back onto 84 is, a line of crap, <laughs> okay? Um, we have a sign at the end of Hancock Road that says no turnaround. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't, listen, I, I've been in the industry. Half the truckers are pretty cool. Half of them are, okay. Remember half the world's crazy? So these guys don't care. The piss bottles are only part of it. Um, driving down my road, I can remember trying to get by one guy with the snap-on truck. He ran me off the road because he's pissed. You're in the wrong place. You're, you're, you're turning around in a road you're not supposed to be. I just worked 12 hours. I got 300 feet to go to my house. That was with one truck stop. I'm going to tell you now, I worked for Napa. I sold the business. And uh, I come down 84 or the side road from Put Putnam every day. I, I've been noticing when you get off the exit for the new loves, this is every day. There's two or three trucks coming from Love. There's two trucks coming from the other side. There's two trucks in front of me. It's becoming truck international. I paid off my house when I sold the business because I plan on dying in this town. I don't plan on dying here tonight, but I plan on... <laughs> Please. <laughs> but I, I, I want to spend my life in this town. So I'm speaking from the love of the town. This is insane. I, I can't even believe this proposal was brought up to us. And I blame myself because like I said, the Love's truck stop got put in. I didn't even know that the meetings were going on. I, I don't know how you get involved in these meetings. 
So I started joining one of the Willington um, Facebook sites. Half you people are really crazy, by the way. <laughs> but, but I shut my mouth. You don't even know I'm on because I never said a word. But I learned, that's how I learned about these meetings. That I, I don't know how you guys announce these to the town. I mean, I live on Hancock Road and I don't know that the Loves is being built. My fault, I never got involved. But how do the people that were within less than a mile don't know that this major thing is happening? And by the way, <laughs> I woke up about two months after that and they were building three houses across the street from me. <laughs> I, I can't do my naked rain dance in the front window anymore. That was important. Why do you think we're having a drought? I, I don't do a naked rain dance in case anybody was questioning. By the way, the only reason that I never got rid of that shed is I ran out of money. So I was thinking why tonight I could do a fundraiser. Can't afford shed help. Please make out your check C-A-S-H. <laughs> Leave your name and I'll put a little tag. Anyway, I'm saying this from love and funny, but this is a nightmare. Um, I read a note, I think you're the select woman. I, I never met you. Um, I didn't vote for you because you, you're on the other party. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just teasing with you. Um, but your letter said that you weren't putting this up for a vote to the town. This is pretty major. I, I don't know what you guys feel. And by the way, I, I, again, I just met you the last two meetings. It's the first two meetings I've ever been to. I like you, the guy that talks in the center. You're a nice guy. I don't even know you. And you look like Santa Claus, so I like you already, too. No, seriously, I don't know you people, so I have no personal judge or feelings one way or the other. I guess I'm putting the trust of everything I've worked my whole life for, which is that little house on 25 Hancock Road, everything I've worked for, except for my children, is in that home. And if I'm going to lose 25% of everything I ever made, everything I've ever hoped for, I did not move into this town to be the truck haven of New England. I think there's other ways we could probably expand our financial incomes. And people have spoken a lot better than me about the $2 million, which is going to be deferred. There's going to be problems. And if you have any idea what's going on globally, I don't believe they're even gonna finish the project or fill it. I think we're gonna have a lot of changes in the world and in the country. But that being said, that's not what I want this town to be. I love, I call it my little one horse town. <laughs> I don't want it to change. So please vote no on everything. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Ron and Tina uh, Ammons de Mello. Okay. Want me to leave your name on the list for next time? Okay. Evan uh, Cartbiano. Evan Cart Cartabiano. Arthur Christensen. Good evening. Arthur Christensen, 14 Birch Meadow Lane. First off, I just want to say I'm against this zone change with regards to the proposed project. I think that's fairly obvious. But with that being said, I didn't know what else I could say that the fine people of this town haven't already talked about. The noise, the pollution, the traffic congestion, the disturbance of the nature and the beauty of this town all have been expertly expressed. So I wasn't sure which direction to go when I spoke. 
until I heard the group building this mention that they built a similar facility in North Haven. I know North Haven very well. I grew up in the neighboring town of Wallingford and lived there for 28 years. My grandparents lived there until they died. So I did some research on the North Haven facility and I thought it might be helpful to make some comparisons between the existing building that's there and this proposed facility. As you can see by the pictures I gave you, the size and scale of the existing lot, the actual construction of the project and the finished building. It's important to know that North Haven has a sizable industrial area, which is where this facility was built. It actually sits on a site that used to be a Pratt & Whitney engine manufacturing plant. So the basic layout for a large scale warehouse style building was already there. There were no trees to knock down, no rock to blast, no nature to disturb and displace. It's an 855,000 square foot building or just over half the size of what's being proposed here. And it sits on a 1.2 million square foot site. That means the entire site could fit into the building that they're proposing here and include both an average size Target and an average size Walmart, so nobody has to choose. Fun fact, with a 1.5 million square foot building, every man, woman, and child in this town could fit in a roughly 270 square foot box within the facility. A family of three would get an 800 and square, 810 square feet to themselves with the size of a small apartment. But back to North Haven. That building is roughly the size of 18 football fields. For this proposal, double that. The North Haven site was constructed with 12,000 tons of structural steel. Double that. 62,764 cubic yards of concrete. Double that. And finally, over 100 miles of cable and wiring in the facility. Double that. The North Haven building is off of Route 5, which is a major route. It spans across three states and is home to over 100 businesses in North Haven alone. It's a fairly busy road, but traffic going down that road has already been studied and the light design has been optimized to the best of the DOT ability. However, once this facility was in, traffic became so bad that a small service road in the back of the facility had to be expanded, repaired, and reopened to alleviate congestion. That project is still in progress and the town is responsible for completing that work, not the builders, not Amazon who occupies the building. One last point about that is that this facility in North Haven has two entrances, a direct and an indirect entrance. And there was still so much traffic that they needed a third. Our proposal is double this size with one entrance. On top of that, when I reviewed the plans, they have a guard shack on the top of the driveway. I'm assuming this is to check in trucks and advise them where they need to go. That takes time. And if it's during the busy period, there will be trucks and cars waiting all the way down that driveway and onto the road. And if you don't believe that, just remember what used to happen at the tolls in Massachusetts during rush hour. Even in easy pass lanes where cars and trucks could just drive right through, there were traffic jams. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the uncertainty of all this. After all, the project as proposed is only 30% complete, and that leaves more questions than answers. One of the immediate ones that comes to my mind is how does their wastewater system function when there's no wastewater in a drought that we have right now? What is their water backup? Another question I asked, I actually asked them at the meet and greet on July 13th. And I said that at only 30% of a project, what, if anything, do you anticipate changing? Their answer to me was anything and everything. And with a proposal this large, that's a scary answer. I want to close by saying I'm not anti-trucker or afraid of trucks or anything. Truckers and trucks make our country work and we need them. I'm not against the people proposing this project either. They're just trying to do their job and get a facility built. And honestly, I'm not against facilities like this because this state, this country, and this world needs buildings like this, but Wellington doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Josh Nash.
Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Jocelyn Lucas Nash, I reside on River Road. I have wanted to live in Willington since 2005 when I started, when I first started dating my husband. Willington offered many things that my hometown could not. It offered peace, quiet, hardly any streetlights, and a place that felt safe. A small community where people actually knew each other by their names. A place where I could sit outside on a clear night and hear peep frogs and watch the stars. I was able to purchase my dream property in 2011, and I've enjoyed multiple wildlife sightings, including monarch butterflies this year, which is a first for me, with little background noise and privacy from my neighbors. This proposed zoning change threatens to take all of that away. In 2005, um, 2015, there was talk about putting a gun range in our town, and I was so impressed by my fellow friends and neighbors for banding together to voice our concerns and prove that this type of project did not belong in our town. The, pro the proposed zoning change in warehouse brings very similar concerns that the gun range did, including but not limited to noise, light, and air pollution, traffic concerns, not just on Route 32, but surrounding routes. Also, how will this impact bus routes to our schools, to students who go to the tech schools outside our area? What about getting to the races on Friday night? I know many of us go to Stafford, support our local race car drivers. What about our roads? Will they deteriorate faster? And who's gonna be responsible for fixing them? And environmental changes. Do we have areas with endangered species, both wildlife and vegetation? And while the true impact of these concerns are only speculation at this point, by the time their true impact will be known, it will be too late to do anything. I've been seeing an increase of posts regarding the concerns of traffic and tractor trailers regarding the new Love's truck stop and the litter that's on the side of the road. And even the local intersections of Route 32 and 74 have become unflattering lately. Perhaps we need to focus on the current issues before we bring in more potential new ones. I am hoping that the board will take this as an opportunity to gather more information from the members of the community to see what the town, what the town needs and wants are. What are our town's long-term goals and objectives? What do we see for the future of Wellington? Where do we see commercial space and residential space? And how do we get there? I'm asking the board to please vote no on the zoning change proposal. Please consider what Willington means to many of us that are your fellow neighbors, friends, and families. And please do not ruin what so many of us have worked for and want to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Smith. Paul Smith. Rosa Chinchilla. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Rosalina Chinchilla and I'm, um, I live at Five Common Road. And um, that is on the green. And um, my, many of my neighbors have said what I was planning to say. I only wanna point out that according to the, uh, the information that the New Haven and Hill Work Groups gave us, uh, this would be a, a building that's seven stories high. So it's not just huge in terms of the 1.5 million square feet, it's also in terms of height. And if you think about it, 
in stores, there is not any building that's higher than seven feet high. So just to give you a sense of how tall that building they're planning is going to be. And um, so, so I'm gonna skip over some of the stuff that's already been said, but I do want to uh, let you know that I walked along Trust Road many, many times it, during the pandemic. And uh, I, I was taken there by my neighbor because uh, she told me how beautiful the flowers, the wildflowers that were grew there in May. And we did identify at one uh, Eastern Columbine and also a pink lady slipper. And um, she identified many, many other wildflowers as, as we walked and we saw the, the natural beauty of the brook that runs through Trask Road. And um, lady, uh, the, lady, the lady slippers that are of yellow and white color is an endangered species in the state of Connecticut. And the Eastern Columbine is a protected species. Uh, so, so, and then we look, we drove down 32 and um, the mobile gas station is only four tenths of a mile from the um, from the River Road recreational area where my children played soccer every Saturday. Uh, and so that means everybody who lives south of 84 has to go on Route 32 to get to the recreational area every every week maybe twice a week, maybe sometimes three, four times a week. And, and these are children, I mean, little children. We're not talking about high school children, we're talking about little children. And they're, gonna, they're only gonna be very less than a mile from all this traffic, all these trucks, all these people that are, that are not part of our, um, of our neighborhood. And um, the pollution, is, is very concerning, particularly the well water. I know it sounds like the, the well water isn't gonna be affected, but I have to say that my neighbor uh, in, in front of the green uh, with only uh, raising Route 74 with the pavement as it is currently, and with the change of uh, uh, stuff that we throw on the ground in the winter time has polluted his well completely so that he has to get water, uh, he has to buy water for everything because his water is so high in uh, chemicals that are thrown on the ground. So I, when I, as I, we walked and I told you, I saw a, a great blue heron fly over us and the great blue heron was obviously following the water routes, right? So uh, it's Conan, the little brook that was mentioned by the uh, person from Conservation Commission, uh, the, uh, the brook then runs to the Parasec Pond, then onto the Sharps Mill Pond, and finally to Hull Pond, which is the pride and joy, I think, of our, of our town because we have one of the few ponds that hasn't been closed because of bacterial growth. And so I think it would be a shame if we were to lose uh, these beautiful places. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to say that um, we also don't know who the tenants are. And that to me is concerning. I mean, so far we've been told that the tenants are gonna be uh, Mill Brothers, cereal companies or something like that. But we really don't know who the tenants are gonna be. So the tenants could, bring, could conceivably bring uh, hazardous chemicals or other things like that. And, um, and again, uh, as many of the neighbors have said, we could be facing an abandoned warehouse and then what good would that be to us? Uh, and uh, finally, regarding the traffic, I, I just might add that I live off of Route 74 and um, 
trucks have regularly been taking Common Road as a bypass to uh, get back to 320. And um, we used to have a very low wire in May 2020, the Friday before the horrible incident in our town. Um, a FedEx truck, an 18 wheeler came barreling down, took out our wires. And the next day we didn't have any communication. So we didn't know what was going on. And, um, and it was a concerning situation. And I, I can just imagine how GPS is gonna reroute people through Trask Road, through any of the little tiny roads, because the GPS system doesn't realize that it's a dirt road or that it's a little tiny road or that there's low wires hanging on a road. Um, and so, um, I would just respectfully ask you to consider how this change of zone will affect the nature of our small town in the far corner and its residents. And I really entreat you to please vote against this. Thank you, Rosa. Devra Kemp. Devra Kemp. Stephen Dion, John Walsh, Ed and Sally Taman, and Marissa Pelletier. And one after that, Elaine Newcomb. Hi, this is Steve Dion. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Stephen Dion. Yes. I was at the meeting in July. Um, I can't be there tonight. So if you can hear me, I'll do this remotely. Um, like, Go ahead. OK, thanks. Like most of my neighbors, I'm very much against uh, this project um, for three reasons. And I'll, I'll summarize them quickly. Um, the first is scale. You know, this, this project is just freakishly out of place uh, for the town of Willington. I mean, maybe it's appropriate for um, Central Texas, but um, you know, in our small town, it, it just does not fit in with anything in our town or, or around our town. Um, this, the second point I wanted to make is I wanted to take exception to something the applicant's lawyer said at, said at the first meeting. The applicant's lawyer made a point, basically he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said that it would be in the town's interest to let this progress. Um, it would be good for the town to get more information. Um, the town would have plenty of opportunity to say no, you know, further down the road. Um, I really disagree with that. I think you know, as, as more lawyers get behind the applicant's proposal and this thing gets rolling, um, our little town doesn't have the firepower to, to deal with, with that type of a, of a team. Um, so I, I really don't think we should let this go. I think we should nip this in the bud now and, um, and say no now. I, I, I really disagree with what the applicant's lawyer was suggesting at the first meeting. Um, and my third point is um, is taxes. And, you know, the only good thing I've I've heard is that you know maybe there's some benefit, some tax benefit to this project. Um, you know, they suggested you know two and a half million dollars in their initial meeting. You know, I'm I'm sure that was um, made assumptions that were favorable to the applicant, but you know even that amount of money. Um, I don't think that's worth the town basically selling its soul for two and a half million dollars. You know, our taxes were due on August 1st and, you know, all of us, you know, went down to the town office or, and, and wrote out that check for our, our property taxes and our, our motor vehicle taxes. And, 
you know, and I did too, and, and it hurts, you know, taxes are high and, um, it, you know, it's hard, um, but we do it. And, you know, we collectively do it as a town, as all, of, all the town residents. And, and we do that because we like this town and we like what this town provides. And, you know, our priorities are, you know, schools and education and roads, um, quality of life and, and the transfer station. And another thing that we really want to receive with our taxes is some zoning protection. And um, that's what you guys are tasked with. And I, I, it's, um, you know, so I know you have to weigh everything that you're hearing. Um, and I hope you're hearing, you know, what seems to be the overwhelming opinion of, of the residents of being against this. So I, I hope you hear that and um, take that in mind when you, when you make this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Marisa Pelletier, 227 River Road. Um, thank you for serving our community and representing the best interest of Wellington. Uh, let's consider the aquifer and the water tables. I know this has already been addressed, but this point hasn't really been talked about. Um, so this is significant for two reasons. Firstly, Wellington has experienced industrial impacts on wells in the past. And secondly, an environmental study within close proximity to the proposed warehouse location has already been performed. Um, I'll start with a brief history. Wellington has seen the negative impacts associated with residents living close to industry. In 1989, the DOT built building on the corner of Route 32 and 74 contaminated several residents' wells with benzene, a byproduct of gasoline and known carcinogen. This was devastating. One home across the street from the DOT was ultimately raised in 2009 after years of unsuccessful well remediation attempts, which cost the state approximately $25,000 per year. That was one home. In 1994, the DOT looked to build a salt shed on land closer to the highway. Wellington officials were at a disadvantage. They couldn't dictate how the land could be used by the state. Still, Wellington persevered. They obtained an environmental study through a state-funded organization which determined that the land was home to Willington's primary aquifer. This aquifer is significant in that it would serve as a groundwater recharge area for municipal water supply, should it be needed. Consequently, pointing to the previous DOT experience and the threat of pollution, the facility was never built. Our town protected our water and in turn acquired the land now known as River Road Athletic Complex, the site of Willington's primary aquifer. That was their legacy. According to Willington's aquifer map, our primary aquifer extends from the park to directly beneath the warehouse site. This aquifer has been identified as a stratified drift, one that is influenced by surface water and land use activities, and therefore considered most susceptible to contamination. It must also be noted that the Willimantic River is in close proximity to this area as well. Considering that the relatively small DOT building had been capable of causing untold damage to those residing down gradient, what threats would we face if a warehouse of this magnitude were to be built? We don't know what this warehouse will be, what it will store, or how it may evolve in the future. Will this warehouse be home to items that require chemical fire suppression, harmful carcinogens made famous for ruining water sources and rivers? Will the warehouse contain large amounts of refrigerant or other hazardous materials? We can't know since there is no tenant. 
One guarantee is that an incredible amount of cars and trucks will be entering, exiting, and idling at the facility each day. There's a great potential for oil, fuel, diesel exhaust fluid, and coolant leaks. The steep entrance and its paved lot will need to be generously salted and treated. Electric vans present an even greater risk of spontaneous explosions and difficult to extinguish lithium ion fires that can also contaminate soil and groundwater with nickel, cobalt, manganese, and other heavy metals. The batteries reignite. Fires can't be easily put out with water alone, often relying on the PFAS foam. All of these toxins will seep beneath the soil or flow downhill with stormwater run runoff. And Mr. Parizek already talked about that with the bedrock. As the chairman of Willington Wetlands stated in 1996, it doesn't take much pollution to render an aquifer unusable. While Hillwood has assured us that environmental studies would be conducted, there's no need to duplicate history. It was not appropriate for the state of Connecticut to build on our aquifer, nor should it be permissible to allow a warehouse either. Proximity to the aquifer and the elevation negates any industry and industrial runoff that could threaten our water. Alternatively, the cost to remediate water sources or to pipe city water into our community can come at significant cost with additional financial burdens placed on residents needing to tie in. All this presents a net negative to our community and is in direct conflict with our plan of conservation. How can a town thrive if our wells and rivers are contaminated? Willington will bear the burden of traffic at our doorsteps and the danger of toxins running behind our homes, our school, and within our drinking water. Clean water is more valuable than any financial temptation that this warehouse could offer. As elected members representing the best interest of our town and the safety of persons and property, I urge the commission to once again defend our town against the long-term environmental impacts and the consequences that would become our legacy should this project be allowed to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. All right, John Walsh will be next, then Ed and Sally Taman. Okay, Ed, Ed and Sally Taman. Hi, Sally Taman, 19 Lisa Lane. Um, pretty nervous about talking in front of a whole group of people. Um, I just wanted to mention that if you were not born and raised in Willington, you came to Willington for a reason. My husband and I moved here in 1988 to start our life, raise our family. We chose Willington because of the beauty of the town, because of the closeness of the people. Um, we just really wanted our family to grow up in that type of situation. We've, we've grown our home to be a little slice of heaven for us that our boys like to come home to. And we would really like to keep that dream alive for future families coming to Willington. I think if we see the warehouse as we come over the hill on 84, that that would destroy any vision of any hope for any family wanting to settle in Willington in the future. And I would really urge you to please vote no on the zone change. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Ed Taman, Lisa Lane. I am here tonight <clears throat> in two capacities, uh, both personally and as a member of the Willington Park and Recreation Committee. And I've been authorized to speak on behalf of the Willington Rec Park and Recreation Committee. And I will let you know in what capacity I'm speaking and when. Uh, I'm speaking first in my own personal capacity. At the outset, I wanna thank all of you, uh, all of the members, of the um, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, 
Committee Commission, and uh, as well as uh, First Selectman Luzinski, I thank you for all the work you do. Um, the first, you know, I've been in, we've been in town since 1988. The first committee I ever, I've been on many committees and boards over the years. The first one I was ever on was the Planning and Zoning Commission. And I didn't stay on it for too long because it was like work. You know, it's, 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 uh, it was, it's hard. I know what you do is hard. And I thank you for all your work, all your hard work. Um, obviously, I am opposed to the proposed um, um, change here, the, the project that's been presented to the town. It will, it will be, a, it would be a radical change to the fabric of this community. It will flip it from a quiet rural town to a busy industrial town. Uh, you know, when my wife and I were first looking, we were actually just engaged at the time, first looking as to where we were going to live. Um, if we had seen, when we came over the hill on, on I-84, if we had seen this development, we would have just moved on. We would not have, we would not have moved here. There's no way I would want to live in this town with this, with this development. I would have just moved on to another town. Um, the increased traffic, we've all driven in heavy traffic at some point in our lives, and it's stressful. You know, I drive all over the state for my work. And sometimes I find myself on 95 or Route 8 or 84 up and down, you know, Waterbury stuck in traffic. And just the increased traffic is stressful. And this, bringing this project to fruition will create more stress for people in town because then we're gonna have to contend with all the traffic. Regardless of how you look at it, there's, it'll be, it, you're, inje you're in injecting another 2,400 vehicles into this town on a daily basis, either coming and going. And I think if the project is allowed to uh, be built or is approved, I think the people will regret it. I think down the road for many years, people will look back and rue the day that this was approved. And I think it will make a lot of people angry for a long time to come. Routes 32, 74, 44, in addition to I-84, will all bear this traffic. It won't just affect Willington. It's going to affect the entire region. These trucks come from somewhere. It's going to affect Eastford, Ashford, Mansfield, Stafford Springs, Willimannock. In addition to the on-off ramps on 84, it's going to affect the entire region. And for what? For some tax revenue, yes, a couple million dollars a year is nice. We would all like to see that. But is it worth it? Are, are any of our taxes going to be reduced? To the extent they're reduced, I don't want it. I'll just pay it. I'll pay it rather than have this project. And with all respect to the people who the Board of Finance and everyone in town who runs the finances and is involved, history has shown that when you increase tax revenue, it's, there's a, they find a way to spend it. It does not reduce the taxes. It, you find a way to spend it. You know, this project will also hurt businesses in town. A few weeks ago, I went out to buy some couple grinders and I like to, Again, I live on the side of town over near the Stafford line. Uh, and um, so when I went out to get a couple grinders, went to Willington Pizza. And I like to give my business to, to the people in town. And I like going to, I like going to lots and more. I like buying, if I need to buy a six pack of beer, I go down to the, what used to be what, Helen's Liquors. It's now, there's a new owner. I like to give them my business. They need the business. And I like, patronizing those businesses. And I have to tell you, if this development goes through, that's not gonna happen anymore. Because I'm not gonna wanna go through this, this gauntlet of trucks and cars just to go out and get a grinder or go through lots and more and, and just browse around, see what's, what they have to offer. I'll just, I can, anything I, that I can buy in Willington, I can get it in Stafford. And that's what I'll do if this development goes through. It will hurt businesses. People will not want to go through that just to, um, just to, to shop locally. 
Now I'm going to speak as a, uh, as a, in my capacity as a member of the uh, Willington Parks and Recreation Committee. We stand united in our opposition to this proposed development. The Willington Parks and Recreation Commission has worked tirelessly for many, many years, over 20 years, building the River Road Recreation Facility. And we firmly believe that the increased traffic, the noise, the exhaust pollution will all negatively affect the residents' use and enjoyment of that facility. We urge you, please do not approve this facility. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine Newcomb. Hi, um, I didn't know if I would make it here. So actually I wrote a letter which will be keep me on track. Um, but first as background, I grew up in Northern New Jersey. I know trucks, I know Cancer Gulch down there and the whole thing. I came to Yukon to go to school and I never left. Um, I graduated in 1972 and um, my husband and I lived here. And then in 1975, we purchased our home here. So, um, been here a while, don't see anything better. Um, we would hope to have commercial uh, partners in the community. The proposed facility is a moneymaker project for New Haven Group slash Hillwood. They hope to develop the quote, biggest and best, and then sell or lease to another unknown entity. The end user is not here discussing their impact with us. The facility will want supremacy on a few of our major arteries. They will compete with the use by all residents, but mostly impact the Willington River Road Park, our major recreational resource, the veterinary clinic, commuter parking lot, local residents, and the orchard business, which hosts family events in season. Local residents will be competing with hundreds of tractor trailers and workers' cars day and night. Traffic patterns will be altered day and night, including additional roads as yet undis uh, undiscussed, um, especially Route 74. We would welcome development of commercial properties that will be partners in Willington and responsible development of commercial properties um, oh, and responsible development of the commercial properties that have fallen into disuse. It's all a matter of scale. What's here is precious and we really shouldn't, shouldn't lose that. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Gotta get the other list. All right, I'm gonna call a few off this list and we're gonna see who's online that would like to make some comments. Probably do like four off here, then we'll switch online and see how far we get. Mary Newman. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My husband is an architect, and this is a letter that he has submitted, so I'm just going to read it. Um, it is to the members of the Willington Planning and Zoning Commission. He attended the July 19th, 2022 presentation here. 
And he's writing this letter as a registered Connecticut architect with over 40 years of experience in designing commercial buildings to express his strong opposition to allowing this zoning change to take place. Although it was claimed that only 30% of the proposed site plan needed to be disclosed, he can tell that from his experience, a lot of planning from the developers has already gone into this project to make the numbers work. The building height of this distribution centers or of distribution centers are now averaging around 50 feet. The floor must be perfectly flat to accommodate narrow aisles, high bay stacking. A quarter inch difference at the floor can translate to four to five inches at the top rack level. Robotics and state of the art picking solutions are becoming the norm rather than the exception. Because of the stacking arrangement, each level within the rack, a wooden skid loaded with merchandise, will require a sprinkler head for fire protection. That will mean a large water reserve for firefighting. By what he believes, uh, by the way of the emission, was the final finish site grade elevation will be about 600 feet. In his letter he sent included a topographical map. The site will need to be graded nearly level to accommodate the new building footprint. The high point on site is 682 feet. This means about 82 feet will need to be removed. That will require a lot of blasting, rock removal, and earth moving. Again, the low edge of the site will require, depending how fill is redistributed or riprap installed, 50 feet retaining walls along the north and west elevations. And this will include retain, retaining walls along the state forest property on the northeast corner. Because of site utilization, property line to property line. This project will not be a low impact site development. He believes that the Route 32 entrance drive will begin around elevation 425 feet being that the proposed drive length is about 2,500 to 3,800 feet, 175 feet of elevation grave change that makes the driveway grade about 4.5 to 7.0%, doable, but in low gear. Hence the concerns of the neighbors with truck noise. Plus, because of the elevation of the site, the noise will carry much further. Regarding stormwater drainage, it seems as though the site from his observation is mass rock. Not sure how drainage structures will allow reabsorption of all that water without excavating more rock. A hurricane event would produce an average of three to six inches of rainfall in a 24 hour period, and at times one to two inches per hour. 2.5 million square feet of surface area times six inches equals 935,000 gallons of water. Potential flash flooding across to Route 32. The traffic study only included morning and afternoon rush hour for warehouse operations, excluding Route 74 direct route east to Rhode Island. Where do the other 2,000 trucks go? Fulfillment centers may use smaller truck deliveries at much higher frequency. There were a lot of we don't know scattered throughout the presentation. Certainly the comment that the project will have little visual impact can be disputed. We implore you to vote no on this zone change proposal for PZ22-10. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Mueller. I'm Richard Mueller at Five Common Road. Um, I want to applaud the PCV, the committee, for all their hard work, and thank you. I want to applaud everybody who gave 
testimony at this last time in this night for incredibly and wonderful arguments why this should not be built. I only wanted to mention one little thing. At the last meeting, uh, Ralph, I think, asked the, the people when they first decided to do this project. And the man at the podium said, a year ago, suddenly someone rushed up and said, no, it was only six months ago. There's something in this, I don't know what, that has to do with legality and what they might claim to be some using pressure on, on, the, on, the, on the basis of something that was done six months ago, I don't know. I just bring that up as a, as a concern, my concern. There are some other concerns, but they've all been addressed by other people. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Thomas Pippin. Good evening, my name is Thomas Pippin and I live on 46 Schofield Road. I would like to thank the board for allowing me to speak tonight. I would like to start off by saying how much I truly love Willington. I love the rural charm of my town and I've lived here my entire life. My family has lived here for several generations and that is one of the reasons why I'm against this proposal. We all know our town is losing population and having a warehouse here will only contribute to more outbound migration of people leaving this town. I'd like to speak on the issue of traffic. I personally have dealt with several traffic issues prior to the Loves Complex opening. I'd like to provide some information that was taken from a 2019 NHTSA survey regarding fatal accidents involving tractor trailers. The study concluded that 71% of fatalities were drivers of other vehicles and only 18% were the deaths of the truck drivers themselves. On the types of roads that these accidents occurred on, 75% were on non-interstate roads. 57% of these deaths occurred on rural land and 77% of fatal accidents happened on weekdays, with 72% of the deaths happening between the hours of 6 a.m. to 5.59 p.m. on weekdays. These numbers are very similar to the amount of injuries caused by tractor trailers. These are not random hours of the day or in busy areas like New Haven or New York City. These are places like Willington on state roads like 32, 74, 320, 195, 44, and possibly other town and state roads. These people that are driving on these roads at these times are not just at random hours. Again, these are people driving their kids to school and people driving to and from work. This is pointing out the lack of infrastructure to accommodate the large amount of trucks, and it's not against the truck drivers themselves. The applicants have stated there would be at least a few hundred trucks per day, which, would, which we all know is a fraction of what the increase in traffic could be. In addition, the applicants have also stated that their work will not be finished with this warehouse. In the previous meeting, a map was shown of the properties along Route 32 from the proposed site all the way down to the intersection of Route 74 for possible business potential. This would mean that they would want to develop more of our town and make what was once a quiet little woodsy town into an area with large buildings surrounded by a sea of tar. This does not even take into account the high amount of water usage that this facility would require. Right now, we are in a severe drought, and if this warehouse is built, they would demand water rights from the town, which would put more, more strain on our uh, wells and our groundwater supply. If and when another drought comes in, uh, we could see our town lose a tremendous amount of water causing more issues for us. These are just a few of the many issues that I draw concern with this. And for these and all the other reasons, I'm against this warehouse. As I said before, I love this town and I don't want it to be ruined by some greedy corporation that thought it would be a good idea to start abusing our land to make a profit. Again, I wanna thank the board for allowing me to speak tonight. Not only am I speaking for myself, but I'm voicing my grandparents' opposition to this warehouse. Due to their health, they were not able to attend this meeting tonight. This is not the Willington they sought after to raise a family, nor is it the same family that my parents did as well. It is definitely not the place that I want to live in when I have a massive warehouse, which would be in the top 15th largest warehouses in the world, quite literally at the end of my street. 
I do not want this tight knit and warm community that I live in to be turned into the Northeast trucking hub that we appear to be heading towards. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. I'm going to uh, call one more name off this list before we switch to picking some people uh, that are online. Uh, Penny Dion. Penny Dion, 55 Fishy Hill Road here in Wellington. Um, and thank you for. Oh, hello. Can you hear it now? Okay. Um, thank you for. Okay, um, we chose Wellington for its natural beauty, wildlife, peace and quiet, sense of community, and that it was near Yukon. We chose Wellington, now we want to protect Wellington and all that makes Wellington a special place. This proposal is a threat to everything Wellington represents. Instead of an unspoiled ecosystem, this zone change proposes clear cutting 160 acres of forest, on a steep hillside, hilltop, home to wildlife streams and trees that purify the air, building a mega warehouse, mega, no, I guess it's four megas we learned tonight, mega, 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 mega <laughs> warehouse on most of all of the land, hosting a never ending flow of thousands of tra uh, tractor trailers day and night, giving us air pollution, noise, trafficking the local roads and the highway exits. The tax argument is bogus. This operation will lower property values in Wellington and surrounding towns. Driving on I-84, this hilltop operation would read like a bad billboard as you drive by. Who would choose the Wellington this proposal wants to create? We chose Wellington in 1979 and we stayed here ever since then. Now it's time to protect it so the next generation can experience all that is good about it. I hope the zoning board feels the same way. Protect our Wellington. Once it's destroyed, it'll be gone forever. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna uh, try to pick some people online that want to speak. Anyone that uh, what's your name? I did call it. Go ahead. Why don't you come on? Go ahead. I don't like this. Sorry about that. That's all right. Thank you for thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Sorry for not hearing my name being called earlier. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this ladies, where you live. Yes, my name is Afir Hussein. I live at 48 Myrtle Road. Um, thank you, members, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, the members of the town have made a lot of good points, especially about the warehouse that's being built. I was thinking mostly about the business in Willington should be that of the town should benefit the town and aid in the vision of the town's will. With that being said, we can't overlook the positive perspective of taxes. $2.5 million is a significant amount of money that will come to the town. It will increase our tax base by about 18%. To put into perspective, conservatively looking at single family homes that generate about $6,000 in taxes a year, we would build, need to build 417 new homes in order to get this $2.5 million. But we can't sell to the first bidder because even though they show $2.5 million, this is not guaranteed. Based on the structure of the applicant, one can infer that they're structuring their LLC in order to capitalize on business losses or evade taxes in order to maximize their profits. The $2.5 million is not guaranteed, like I said. Another thing that I saw about the um, applicant is their business behavior. One of the things that is clear is that we don't know who are applicant really is and who we're gonna be talking to directly. Another issue that we saw is their PR issue. 
The applicant has a global footprint. With that said, they do not operate by the, they do not operate by the seat of their pants. As a global company, they have procedures and policies in place to ensure their standard of excellence is maintained. The selection process, which they must have ex exercised to choose their initial PR company, that I, that may I remind us all here, that went door to door to members of our community that have been outspoken in opposition to this zone change, is a window into the standard that this applicant holds for themselves, to ensure victory at all costs for themselves and only for themselves. They are mere visitors to our town, yet they feel they have the privilege to use harassment tactics to get what they want. Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you their true colors, believe them. And this is what this applicant is. As we have an aging community, one of the big things that we need to take into consideration is access to the hospital. The closest hospital that we have here to us is Johnson Memorial Hospital located in Stafford via Route 32, exactly where this um, zone change is proposed, roughly 13 miles from Wellington. On top of that, this hospital is planning to expand its senior living center, living care and a nursing facility for elders. At, like I said, as we have an aging population, imagine having an emergency needing to go to the nearest hospital, and now you're bombarded with 200 um, tractor trailers, which may or may not be stuck, trying to save your life. This is not what we want for our residents. Also, the closest hospital being, we want to have new members coming into the community you need access for um, prenatal care and birthing. Once again, you have now um, strangled the lifeline, which is this hospital for us. We need grocery stores, schools, public parks, as the public rec um, representative talked about. Uh, repairs and maintenance of the road has not been talked about and I believe will fall upon the responsibility of the town, which would easily eat up that $2.5 million that they're promising. Uh, the infrastructure, though I appreciate the fact that they're looking to have put this building here, we don't have the logistics to, to house that many people. Restaurants, diesel repair, lodging, traffic, public safety, say, uh, fire and emergency response, trash. These are just some of the topics that would need to be addressed and take, taken, considered and, and have looked at before we even consider having a um, facility such as this. If down the road we, we would like to have larger commercial people, um, commercial residents, these are some things that need to be taken into consideration. One big thing that they talked about is jobs, and I don't hear any job guarantees. As a Wellington resident, paying, a paying taxpayer, I, want to, I, I haven't heard anything about how it will benefit me directly. I'm not gonna get a tax deduction. I'm not gonna be guaranteed jobs for myself, my kids, or any, any other residents in town. Why, why would we want them here? We don't have anything that the logistic company would benefit us directly as, as residents of the town. Let's believe that this does go through and they do are able to construct a building. Well, when the site is left, we're now left with a potential brownfield. A site that has been here for millennia is now going to be turned into something completely and utterly useless. Uh, members of the community have talked about wildlife. And then one thing that the lawyer of the applicant mentioned is that Willington does have the possibility to do an independent review of everything that the applicant is presenting. This is a waste of the town's limited resources. So I urge you, please vote no against the zone change. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch to online. I see Judy uh, three. Whenever you're ready, Judy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, yeah, you guys had to unmute me. Um, thank you for the opportunity to just take a few minutes. I am um, really blown away by my fellow residents on how articulate they are and the points that they've made. So I just, I'm gonna keep this brief and just add two things. Um, I'm a real estate agent in town and I have significant concerns about the- Judy, can you just state your name and address? Oh, sure. Judy 319 Birch Meadow Lane. 
uh, Willington. I've lived here since 2001. Um, like I said, I'm a local real estate agent and I'm concerned about the distribution center's presence in town, creating a significant impact on the housing market that we have here. Over the last several years, we've had significant increases in the value of our homes, um, some as high as 20%. Um, the interest rates going up that has stabilized. However, I believe that the presence of the distribution center could significantly lower the homes starting immediately surrounding the immediate area and then spreading out to the entire town. It would first start with people who listed their homes at prices that previously homes were sold at would last on the market for a long time and they'd have take lower and lower and lower offers and it would just trend downward and I think we would lose probably 20% of our home values. Um, the second point I want to make is I've watched from afar the planning and zoning committee be being concerned about the aesthetics of our town keeping it a quiet um, hometown for most of us by limiting the size of business signs. We don't have these huge monstrosity of signs. They, they're limited in the, how tall they are. They're limited in how big they can be. So it kind of blows me away that if that's what we have done historically, that we're considering the huge, huge, huge distribution center to even have a presence in our town. We need to be consistent. We need to make sure we keep the aesthetics of our town. We need to make sure that we keep the natural aspects of our town, the woods, preserve the animals, preserve the water resources. We all moved here for that reason and we all need to fight for it and we all need to say no. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else online want to speak, put, put a hand up. Once again, anyone else online that would like to uh, speak, just put your, put your hand up to get our attention. Renee Gannon. Hello, my name is Renee. I reside at 92 Ruby Road. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, we recently moved and bought our home at 92 Ruby Road um, in February of 2020. We've been here a year and a half. Um, we chose Willington for the fact that we love the town. We love the natural beauty of the town. Um, and we like the quiet, quaint community feeling that Willington gave us. Um, Living on 320, we have learned how busy of a road that it actually is with the truck traffic um, from both of the, you know, trucks, truck stops that we now have. And my concern with this new proposed warehouse is that we are now going to increase the amount of truck traffic, which will not only affect Route 32, Route 74, 44, as well as 320. Um, it's our infrastructure is not set up to handle the amount of truck traffic that is going to increase rapidly in this town if we allow this kind of a warehouse to be built here. Um, we are also going to affect our wildlife, our aquifers, and it's going to affect everything in a negative impact. So I, for one, as a new town resident, are um, very much against it and would like to keep the town, um, the quaint community that it is and not see a warehouse of this style come in and possibly ruin the beauty of this town. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Renee. Claudia Nunn is next. Claudia Nunn. 
body and not place. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hearing kind of an echo. Um, my husband, well, I live at Seven Common Road in Willington. And my husband and I have lived here for 40 years. We're definitely strongly opposed to the zoning change. And we agree with all the amazing thoughts and heartfelt feelings that have been expressed by so many people. You can't, you can't turn it up anymore. Ladies talk and keep it up and you can leave. How's that sound? Go ahead, Claudia, continue. Okay, are you hearing me okay? Because I hear an echo. Okay, I guess you're hearing me. Close your mic, Claudia, see if it'll come in a little clear. What should I do? Speak a little closer to your microphone, see if it helps. Okay, let me just take out my AirPods. Okay, can you hear me now? I think that's about as good as it's going to be. Go ahead. I don't know. Can you hear me now? Let's see. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, how about that? No, I don't think we're coming through. <laughs> Okay, well, if it's not working, I will just yield. We can hear you. Oh, okay. I can't because I'm getting a little feedback, but thank you. Yes, as many people have said, uh, the building is huge. It's a mega building and with an irreversible mega impact. Just a few figures uh, to add to the size of it. And then a couple comments or suggestions. One of them is that, um, it will be 7.5 times as big as the FedEx building in Willington. Uh, the building would be one half mile long. It would be four and a half city blocks by four and a half city blocks and be 14 times the size of the typical Walmart store. So I oppose it very strongly. And I would suggest now that you've got our attention on this issue and a Apparently there are just so many ideas going here and so much passion and creative energy that maybe we need some way to dialogue about what our vision might be to help with revenue, but yet do it as people have described in a way that we really would want to do it for the future. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing I'd wanna say is besides voting no on the zoning change, I'm wondering about putting like South Windsor has a moratorium on, um, let's see, on, let's see, I'm looking at this, <laughs> um, immediate pause on applications for such facilities. This was a journal inquire article on April 6th of 2022. So a pause on the application for such facilities in order for the planning and zoning commission to fairly assess and revise its regulations in keeping with the town goals. The text of the moratorium in South Windsor lists a number of items to be reviewed by planning and zoning, including restrictions on the size of new buildings, clear definitions on the types of facilities and requiring noise and traffic studies from objective third parties. So I can't restate anything more because so many people have said it so much more eloquently, but I do wanna thank the board for all the hard work and they're volunteering to, to serve Willington and serve us. And then also for the townspeople, it's just incredible. I'm, I am blown away by the thinking, the research, the heartfelt um, things. So thank you for letting me speak. Phyllis B. 
Good evening. Uh, this is Phyllis Perizic Benton. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I am on Trask Road. I grew up here and I've lived here off and on during my entire life. I am against the zoning change to allow this massive project. Individuals um, prior to this have talked about many of the same reasons that I object to this, uh, you know, for conservation reasons, water and air quality. Uh, the impact are among my concerns. Uh, we have a pristine pond, parasitic pond that is downstream from this location. Our family have been owners and good stewards of that land for more than 100 years. And we hope to see that land exist in a semi unspoiled condition for at least another hundred years to come. The proposed zoning change is a huge departure from existing zoning guidelines. Once you do this, the town is opening the door for other large developments and legally that is a door that is going to be hard to close. Once you make the exception for one project, and again, this project from what I have heard uh, discussed by the board and then also from individuals testifying, this project is not close to what was uh, proposed for the, uh, the new uh, commercial zone uh, in that area. It is way, way beyond. So again, once you open that door, as somebody had said earlier, it is a Pandora's box. I have seen this in other locations where an exception is made and then th the locality will face legal challenges. That is gonna cost the town a lot. Again, um, there are associated costs that people have touched upon, you know, infrastructure um, reworking because, uh, there are some of these, there will be town roads that come into play and that is going to be the town's responsibility. Also public safety. You know, we have a, um, a system here in town that I would best describe it as, you know, quasi uh, paid uh, for some positions within our fire service. Uh, I would say that that would have to be greatly enhanced. So whatever you realize for tax dollars, just remember that you are likely going to have to be using that almost directly to support this particular project and the individuals that will come and go to the project on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and you know what, I wanna thank everyone who sits on that board and also the individuals who have taken the time to show up and to be online for this. My dad was uh, on planning and zoning back in the dark ages, I wanna say during the 60s and 70s. And one of the things that they really weighed here in town was how would projects impact the, um, I don't think they, they called it, you know, it wasn't so much an environmental movement then, but you know, how does it impact what's around us and what we hope to use forever going forward? And one of them is the, uh, the water quality here. Many of us are on wells. We are here, of course. And um, once you mess that up, you know, you, you, that's done. You, you can't, uh, you know, fix that. So uh, with that, again, I say thank you. And uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to continue calling names off the list till about 10.15, and we got to get through the rest of our agenda tonight. Uh, Andy Zeminski. After Andy's going to be Bruce Carlson, just so the next person's queued up. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Uh, Andy Siminski, 62 Schofield Road. Recently, I was driving. Does everyone, uh, or a lot of you, do you like music? Yeah. I was driving and I was listening to a song by Joni Mitchell in which she explained, you don't know what you got until it's gone. And I kind of agree with that. Um, I moved here in 2008. I moved from Hartford, Connecticut, where noise is a regular thing. And I, like a lot of people, came up down 84 to move here and coming over the hill from um, Tallinn. It was a beautiful scene. I think if this project is allowed to happen, it will no longer be a beautiful scene. Now I only have two words to describe what I think this project is. It's illogical eyesore. And the reason I say eyesore is because the planners are planning to build this and try to hide it. Why are they trying to hide it? Because it's an eyesore, or it will be an eyesore if it's built. And I uh, really, I don't know about you, but I don't like eyesores. I kind of like the woods, and I like trees. And I like the hill that they're proposing to build it on. And everything I hear about this project, just about everything, is negatives. And it, do you need more negatives in your life? I know I don't. And um, that's about all I got to say. I'm totally against this project. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I believe we have someone here from Pennsylvania, Richard Perizic. Come on up. The hour is late, and there's much to be said about this project. I'm going to give you a copy of a document that gives a review of some of the risks that I see with the project. I will give you my resume so you understand the technology behind the, my concerns based on my resume. There's references to research work of students of mine. I've mentored 98 graduate students in masters and PhD work, and a number of them worked on acid mine related projects. The list of those students are presented there, so you have a backup possibility. And then there was some time ago, we wrote a letter report that dealt with the rifle range. I'll give you a copy of the report that went to the first select moment at the time. And there's one missing page of that, but first selectment office prior to the present one would have copies of that. And I want to give the same documents to the Hillwood group because the Hillwood group has taken risks. They've taken risks to get to a 30% design. And from a business point of view, it could be wasted money from their point of view. You could deny changing the zoning, in which case they spent money for no purpose. But it's kind of a low risk. If they had gone to 100% study, then the risk would even be higher should you have, have denied it. So there's obviously a risk that they've taken. Now, as commissioners, you take risks because no matter whether you decide to have this facility or not have the facility, there'll be people in the community who will be mad at you for either decision you make. But that seems to be the nature of the job description as a commissioner, right? You can't please everybody. You have to work with the information that you have. Now, there are risks with this facility 
And the risks, from my point of view, come back to a series of summary points. And in the beginning of the handout I gave you, you'll find uh, those listed. And I'm not, not going to go into those uh, right now, but I want to get into a little bit more of the depth of the, of the report. I'm Richard Perizic. I live at 751 McKee Street in State College, Pennsylvania. My wife Estelle is here. My daughter Catherine is here with me. And we own 40 acre parcel on Bellas Road. So we have uh, every reason to keep coming back to Connecticut, as well as a number of relatives that we visit regularly. So there's a, I was a resident here from 1934 in August up until 1961 when I went to the Penn State University, but I've come back every year since to visit family members and the countryside. So we have a lot of experience with the region. Now there's a concern that we have about the amount of rock that has to be removed from this site. You've already heard of the ridge that Donald Perizic spoke of. And so much of the top of that property is kind of a north-south trending ridge. There was no topographic map provided in the, in the uh, design information pr provided. But the ridge top is bedrock, it's ledge, and it's the Brimfield Schist ledge. And so we have to keep that in mind. It kind of fits into the total story that we have to talk about. Now, I, I'm familiar with that area because we're going to go back as a kid. About 12 years old, I was taken there hunting with my uncle, Alex Stahansky, who since passed on, with my brother. And we hunted on his property off of Route 74. And we ran upon two deer. We followed the deer. And that was the way it was in those days. If you had a tracking snow, you followed the deer because maybe that's the only deer you'd see. Those are the poaching years of the Depression and of the war years. And so deer were scarce. And we, we jumped the two deers on Alex's property and we continued across Trash Road and we went up over the hill, up on what is now the Benini property. And then the deer turned off and went down eastward into the swampy areas to the east and then this Pine Mountain, it's the next ridge to the east. And, and, and we continued tracking the deer and it was dark when we got to the Hall Memorial Pond. I'm sorry, the Hall's Pond. So that deer went that distance. So that was the way we hunted in those days. Now I've been back on the property uh, again, and I got my first deer some years later on the edge of the state piece, which is uh, the drainage goes into the Roaring Brookside as unnamed tributaries, you know. And then some years later, the largest buck I ever got was in a gouged out depression of bedrock on the west side of the ridge. And that's a, a vernal pool that's in there. There's another vernal pool where the power line makes a turn to the northwest. So you have two vernal pools. Well, you know, from the point of view of the landscape changes that occur there, those vernal pools don't mount to much because they're gonna have wetlands they'll have to build in order to have recharged basins there, right? So you can give up a few of the natural pools, you're gonna make some others from that point of view. So there's a, this, but there are risks in terms of what's in the mountain itself when you start to move the volumes of rock. Now, it's the first time I've heard the level 600 feet that gave us 82 feet of rock removal. I was not familiar with that number, but that's kind of an important thing is how much ledge you might have to take because walking the ridge top, there's almost no glacial drift there. That's the overburden material brought in by ice. And as Dr. Donald Parizic explained, the soil units that are up there are also part of this very thin soil uh, evidence that we have there. The size of the facility makes the TA facility and the Federal Express structures small, they're tiny. And that was uh, what Paul uh, Hipsky talked about, the size of those. Those are, those are peanuts. And I come up 84 to come here to Connecticut and I pass the Hudson Valley and there's some huge, really huge storage facilities down there that you ought to go see. If you haven't seen them, they're, you know, they're, they're getting bigger each time, but they're huge. And so you've already heard about the size of it. This is immense uh, structure. But to remove the mountaintop, the hilltop, down low enough to get to a flat surface, and we heard architectural details of how critical it is not to have any subsidence or not to have misalignments in terms of the structure, again, assuming how the interior of the building works, that's pretty critical. But if you're gonna go down maybe 80 feet of rock in places over a very broad part of the footprint of that hill, uh, you're, you're gonna run into uncertain rock. And we'll come back to that in a minute. 
if I walk the ridge and go north, I go to a little dip, and pretty soon I go to a ridge that has more of a northeast south west trend, Morris Parrot at Route 84, Interstate 80, I'm sorry, 84. So that trend is a sort of maybe maybe sand and gravel. We don't know if there's ledge in there, but if you go there, you'll probably find some white birches are still there. There's some hemlock, uh, not so many hemlocks, but more laurel on the back side of it. That might be sand and gravel. That might be some, somewhat more permeable and easier to remove. And it's about where the leach field is suggested to be, 40,000 square feet of leach field. Well, if you're gonna have a leach field, if it's highly permeable gravel, uh, that's not going to filter out contaminants. You're going to maybe have to engineer a leach field, and that's doable, I guess you could argue. But the whole idea is that that hill has some special geological characteristics to it. On the west side of it, there's a kind of a bench. Come off the ridge top, there's a bench. And the bench is a, is a came terrace. A came terrace, what the heck's that? Well, if you go lower down, there's another terrace down at the level of Route 32. And that's where the veterinarian hospital is located. That's where the, the Baravica home is. That's where the night uh, operations are. And for that matter, if you go off 74 and down at 32, you've got the state garage in there. That's a terrace. Those features are like this. The people there are the bedrock high, looking from Route 32, looking eastly. So you you are bedrock up there. I'm a glacier. You're you're in the in the valley. You're in this case, you're in the Willamette River Valley. So first of all, the glacier is coming and filling the road. Visualize that. Well, it's coming down from the northwest, heading southeastward through this part of Connecticut. So the whole area, the whole room is full of ice. But as the ice is melting down and slowly getting lower and lower, the bedrock highs start to come up out of the, the glacier. Now, in Wellington Hill, there's no sand and gravel up at the up at the square. If you're up there during the memorial services and so on, uh, there's, there's not sand and gravel up there. But come off the hill a little ways down by the by the library, go down around the corner, uh, sand and gravel start to appear there. And those meltwater is against the ice, which is now in the room, lowered quite a bit. And meltwater carrying debris from the ice against the bedrock wall is laying down sand and gravel. And as the ice shrinks lower, we get the Wellington Cemetery area, all the sands and gravels up in that area. And you have some little kettle depressions where icebergs were left buried in the ice and they melt out. So that's the terrace. Well, coming back into the, into the Route 32 side of it, that high level gravel is boulder gravels. I mean, there's a lot of water moving rapidly through the air and tumbling boulders and so on. And then the ice shrinks down a little bit more and it gives the terrace down at the Route 32 level. And then there's the, there's the veterinarian hospital. Between the veterinarian hospital and Barovickers, there's a swamps, kind of a carved out depressions. That's where ice blocks were left behind. Now we already heard about the important sand and gravel aquifer that's along the valley at that lower level. Up at the upper level, it's not very, it's not likely to be saturated because it's not closed off on the west side. The water can drain out of it. So we have a terrace up there. And Bonini took some sand and gravel out of there, down at the Route 32 level. He took back some of that material. But it was probably bouldering. It was dirty. It was not particularly good quality gravel. But nevertheless, he took some out of there. And Mr. Barvik did the same thing. Do you know Barvik is home? You know Barvik is home, just down in that area? Okay, just down by the fire hall? Well, okay, uh, above his house, above the bedrock ledge you see there on 32, there's terrible gravel, but he took it out and got some of it out of there. That's because the current of water has gone through there rapidly. It's not sorting the materials out very much, but that's an important part of the story because part of this building is gonna be involved with maybe terrace gravels high up, and some stormwater could probably be well drained into those gravels, right? But we saw recharge basins suggested at several locations in their 30% design. There was one on the southeast corner of the property up where the, the water tank was supposed to be and perhaps where a well site might be located. And that would be a place to put a recharge basin. 
and I guess in woodlots, because they didn't say the trees were removed, they would dig out some sort of a basin and you'd have a, a drainage in there and you'd have rain garden connections between the paved areas leading to these. So this would be where the water is supposed to infiltrate. But on the southeast corner, that's a problem because there's no sand and gravel up there. There's cobbles and boulders and big chunks of rock that were ripped out by the glaciers heading southeastward. And the boulders are down in the swampy areas between Pine Mountain and, and that ridge. Okay, so we get down in there and so say that's important to understand that. There's not going to be any sand and gravel up there. There's going to be glacial till and it's going to have soil units as uh, Donald Perzik explained to you. And it was also explained to me because in the report that was done by the Conservation Commission, there's a geological, um, the soil map units are given there. And so that's important to me. Now, what are we going to do then is you're going to put water underground up at that area. That's good for uh, the drainage, a non-named tributary to Conant Brook. You're going to have more water. Why are you going to have more water? Because you have a forest up there now. How much of the rainfall that falls there every year is lost to the atmosphere by plants transpiring the water back. I don't have a number for Willington. Uh, and, and I would put a number like 70% maybe for our area in Pennsylvania. So about 70% of annual rainfall would be returned by plants transpiring moisture and evaporating moisture back to the surface of the atmosphere, right? Well, okay, so what happens when you pave so much of this area, more than 70 acres perhaps, You've gotten rid of the evapotranspiration, there are no trees are left, and maybe you're going to come down to an evaporation rate off of pavement and off of building roofs, which is a pretty small number. And you'll find in some calculations toward the back of the handout I gave you of what the numbers might be like. But we're getting into huge amounts of water that has to be gotten rid of underground somehow. So for, for Donald Perisic, his, his his unnamed tributary to Conant Brook will be nourished by that. But you also read in the document that I gave to the prior chair, uh, well, commissioner, this would be the your job. So the prior document is cited in here. Look at what's going on there. We have a lot of data. This is about six to seven or eleven percent of a watershed that's in forest gets altered to pavement or altered to crops other than a forest. And then from a cold water fishery point of view, that's almost lethal, enough that the temperature won't sustain a breeding population of, of say, brook trout, which is what's available presently in the corner, uh, a drainage system, the upper part of the corner drainage system. So one, there's a heat island effect of this massive building that's going to impact that drainage. But there'll be more water, except it won't be suitable for fish. It'll add to the Vertical pools, it'll be more flow down there from, from that point of view. Well, let's go a little further with, with the drainage on the west side. Uh, again, this uh, wall, this 50 foot wall, in order to build a bench, in order to have this flat surface, I, I don't know about that. I've not heard anything about that, nor have I heard how much water 500 employees need. I was going to put some sort of figure on it. Uh, I, what way to come in the building? It was maybe 30,000 gallons a day or something like that. Well, if it's 30,000, you could average that out. Maybe that's 20 gallons a minute. Well, well, getting water out of the Brimfield Schist, many of you have wells. How much water did you get? How deep did you go? On the 19th of July, a gentleman was complaining about his 400 foot deep well might run out of water because of this project. But why did he go 400 feet? He couldn't get water probably at a shallower depth, right? There's no reason to pay that much money to go deeper. In other words, the Brimfield Schist is not highly productive uh, to groundwater. The fractures are here, the fractures are there. They're kind of a random thing. And so one neighbor could have a 50 foot well in the rock, another one might have 150 or 200 foot well just to get by with a home supply. So the site has a difficulty in terms of sustaining the water needs that would be required, except the stormwater generated from the site is going to have to be disposed of. That gives you some water back. Now, I want to get back into the, the, the problem that we had going from the, the blasting of rocks back when I was a kid. This is a Depression era, World War II kid. We had no, no toys exactly, but there was blasting and big machines opening up what later became I-80 
four heading eastward. So when you come out of the uh, mobile station on 32, before you got to turn on to I-84 heading toward Boston, if you want to go there or Ruby Road, uh, this ledge right there, okay? The ledge is still there, it's the same ledge I saw as a kid. My father was alive, he died in 1944, so I don't know quite know when that section of road was being opened up. But go there tomorrow and look at the ledge. After how many years? Well, surely more than 60 years, because ever since I went to Penn State, I'd come back, back and forth as a graduate student in Illinois. I was every year, a couple of times a year. There was never anything growing there. And today, you won't find still much of anything growing there. Now, you know, rocks are bad for plants, but I drive an 80, 81, 84 to get here many times. And then when you go off the highest cliffs in Pennsylvania, after 40 years, this trees clinging to the ledge here, best they can there, little by little, things are invading those slopes. And some of those slopes are, are surprisingly high and, and, and difficult. Well, so anyhow, plants will eventually recolonize the landscape. Heck, when the glaciers left this place, there was no plants, right? You have to get them all back, migrating through time, and that's geologically, and from a, a point of view, very interesting story in its own right. But going back to the bare rock, what's wrong with the rock? The rock is falling off and shedding material. You can come off of the ramp, off of 84, onto 32, take a look on that side, and on the, all kind of staining on the rock, kind of salty materials. Well, for the rifle training facility, I took samples from there. I said, you know, nothing is growing there. There's something wrong with these rocks. And we put them in to the containers, added distilled water, leached them. And what did we find? The pH went from about seven of the water we started with immediately down to three, three to two, you know, very low pHs. But with it came the lead, the zinc, the iron, other things came out of the rock. So what you've got there is rock that's brimfield schist, which is an acid producing environment. Plants don't want to live in that environment. And slowly they'll eventually maybe get rooted in there, but that's telling you something. Now, reading the rocks without plants means something to me. Reading the rocks means a lot to me too. Reading the soils that develop from those rocks are telling us something. So you'll have warnings of some unusual situations there. And now you have the pile higher tight problem, right? And when we were here for the rifle range, nobody used that word because they hadn't yet apparently identified the mineral, but it's in the crumbling foundations. Now you have a huge problem in terms of land values, uh, taxing values on properties. People want to reduce the tax rates. That's an economic problem for the town and how you got to pay for schools. You know the problem. But the point is, why wasn't that seen before? Well, in aggregate, uh, if you were trained to study aggregate, I took uh, soil mechanics courses in Illinois. We learned from people who were Nobel, not Nobel Prize winners, they were National Academy of Engineering members and Academy of Science members. That's how distinguished those people were. And we learned about aggregate, that some things you don't put in concrete because it tends to expand some church, opaline materials, sulfide minerals, those things will destroy concrete. Well, in the case of the, 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 this Northeast Connecticut stuff, the foundation didn't fall apart in an hour. It's a slow problem of getting oxygen diffusing into the cement, the water getting in by diffusion, and slowly and slowly, as it oxidizes, the rock begins to expand, and there's a force that breaks up the concrete, right? So, so that, that's in this brimfield shift somewhere. Now the problem is, if Harwood goes and pushes this project, and they say, we're gonna drill, and we're gonna core, and we're gonna investigate uh, where this mineral might be, I say, that's a very difficult problem to say how many holes, how deep, exactly what are the occurrences of these minerals, and exactly how do they occur? Are they in sheets or beds or fractures? In the case of interstate, I-99 in Pennsylvania, up in Happy Valley, up at the, 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 the Nittany Lions country. We had a highway that was coming into town. 
It's the Appalachian Thruway from Alabama to Corey, New York, and eventually bring it to the state college so we get people in and out of town more safely. The route had to come somehow, and there was five alternative routes, and the one that was picked on the side of a mountain had to come through the core of the crest of the mountain, and in doing so, you had to have deep cuts so that the road grades weren't excessive from an interstate quality of highway, right? And what happened there? The boreholes were for the alignment of the lanes. They would go about just so deep below what was the planned depth of excavation. And at bridges, they would be deeper anytime you had a bridge abutment. So we had many, many drill holes. But R Richard, many, many can, drill can, holes, we, can we start summarizing? Just yeah, see, if you can, is, see if you can wrap it up. That project is $110 million in counting to fix the problem, which includes moving toxic materials to some closed in vault in order to isolate water from it. And it also has sheets of like plastic materials covering the mountainside or the place where road was constructed already with concrete. They didn't want to tear it up. So $110 million because of plants and rocks and an inability to characterize where to put the drill holes and to characterize what you've discovered. So I'm saying for Howard, they need to read this report. They need to be aware that in that mountain, there is a rock condition that could be present anywhere that they might disturb and sort of create a, a real problem. And the quantities of water, you'll see in the data table how much more recharged water you have to get rid of. But if it's in contact with the rock that you're going to have to smash and flatten out, you're, you have a huge surface area that makes an acid reaction almost there much, much greater. Acid will take the minerals, felspars, micas, muscovite, the biotites, and with enough acidity, they break down and release aluminum. So aluminum is in the test result. Take a look at that from what we gave to, to the selectmen. Look at the aluminum values in that quick leach test. Trout will die with leach, say with aluminum, maybe two parts per million, two milligrams per liter. It's not a very high number, but the values could be off scale. That now you're into the Kodak Brook, down into the Parasic Button Factory Pond, down into the Lucinda Pond, down to Hall's Pond. So if I have to summarize, this is a high risk situation. It takes a very careful look at the risk that is being posed and how to minimize the mistakes by the drillings that would be done and the quarries that might be done and attestments that might be done that might overlook the problem. I thank you for your indulgence. I'm sorry it's late, but there's a lot to this problem up here that's of a geological nature, a geochemical nature, it's an environmental nature and it needs to be studied. I'm not opposed to projects, opposed to making sure there's a solution to the problem you might run into in order to have a safe problem. If you don't have a solution in mind, like in a coal mine, I cite it, we got bonds on every acre of disturbed land. So it hopes that the bonding money would force the company to reclaim the mine. But today, in modern days today, we go bankrupt when we want to get out of trouble and we get out of bankruptcy troubles easily because the bond money is not worth as, as much money as it's going to cost to fix the problem. But no bonding is being mentioned for this project. If I think about it, what the risk could be if you have a white elephant left up here in the town. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. All right, so that's it for tonight for uh, for public comment. We're going to continue the hearing. When's our next meeting, Mike? Tuesday, September 6th. All right, get, we're going to take five minutes before we continue. We got to get up. <laughs> Okay, so we're uh, we're back in session. Item E, new business. We're going to skip over that one for tonight. That's the zone change. Nothing under uh, unfinished business. Item G, approval of minutes, July nineteenth, twenty twenty two. All all in favor? Aye. Aye. Item H, uh, correspondence, anything, Mike?
All right, item I, public participation. And this is for items not listed on the agenda. Anyone from the public have anything to say? I see Nick Tella. All right, on. All right, Nicholas Stella, 49 Myrtle. Um, I'm just holding up here on my phone. So I know a common theme, um, and I get it. A lot of the boards, they like to defend their people, the people on the boards, people that work for them, and I get it. Uh, I just wanted to just want to come out and just be on record that you guys do have somebody on the board that openly and proudly admits that they are uh, Antifa. So. Just want to let that be on record uh, and they openly say this and if you are against Antifa then you basically are looking for Jews to be killed and such according to their social media posts. So just wanted that to be on record and again um, if the member wants to address this to the public I think it would be wise because it's not just myself that has this concern there's many other people that have a concern that we have somebody on the board that proudly believes they are Antifa. So. Um, and that's it for now. All right, any other public comment before we move on to the next item? All right, let's move on to item J, staff report and discussion upcoming applications and agendas. So um, the the commission has four other applications which are uh, have been received um, and will will need to include public hearings. Um, we have two text amendment applications. Um, one was the cannabis prohibition that the commission discussed couple of meetings ago, um, which we, we need to schedule if the commission still wants to, to hold it. Um, we have a text amendment application that was submitted for um, making modifications to the strategic development zone regulation. Um, we have a home occupation special permit um, and we have a special permit for a liquor license. Um, so we have those four plus the public hearing, which we continue tonight. Um, and a special permit for a liquor license uh, at uh, the old um, River and Rail. Um, so all four of those require public hearings. We need to notice them. So those four would be set to go at the next meeting in September, which would then put it with the hearing we continue tonight. Um, so I, I just wanted to basically put that on the commission's radar as far as how much you think you can get through in one evening. Um, the only alternative, I think, given that we have noticed and, and, and continued the public hearing for the application that we heard tonight, we could schedule a special meeting, but it would only be for these applications. Um, we would have to take up the zone change at the September 6th meeting, um, but I need to know basically tomorrow or, or Thursday at the latest to be able to schedule those hearings and work with the applicants on a butters. Um, so I just wanted to get a sense from the commission uh, as far as what you wanted to do, given the agenda that we've got. I think we should have a, a special uh, meeting in addition to our regular meetings in September because you know, we're going we're gonna to hit the next meeting on the 6th. We've still got a number of names here on top of who's ever online, whoever wants to be heard. You know, we've made a commitment that we're going to allow that and, uh, and we're going to. So I think we should devote the bulk of that meeting to this. Hopefully, maybe possibly even vote on it. Yeah, that's a, that's a possibility. We get through uh, through everything and uh, go from there. 
So do you, uh, we probably, we probably can't get a special meeting between now and the next meeting, but we can probably get one just after. I agree. So if that's the consensus, um, I can send out a couple of dates that would work for the publishing. And if, if you guys can just respond back with your availability. Um, you guys all good with that? I, I think we kind of need to, if we're going to keep things on the rails, and it's kind of moves along, but I don't think it's kind of needed to be, so. Okay, I, right. I'll have to look at the town's calendar to figure out what we might have overlap with. So we obviously we won't have that meeting here, whether it be a town hall or, or virtual, I'll have to figure that out. But I'll send out three dates. If you guys could just get back to me with what works, uh, we'll, we'll get it scheduled and that should get us through all of this basically by the second. Well, no, so if we had the special meeting after, you could continue any of these other public hearings if you needed to, to the next meeting in September so that Really, they don't lose any time. The uh, the cannabis prohibition and the modifications to the zone; those are our own applications, correct? the The prohibition on cannabis, yes. The text amendment to the SDZ was submitted by a by a, a resident. By what? A resident. Oh, okay, very good. Um, so we've got sixty five days from the date of receipt to open a public hearing. So we're well within that time frame for all of these. Yes. If you want to, I, I don't think you necessarily need to, but if just for formality, you certainly can make one. I make a, I make a motion that we have a uh, schedule a, a special meeting uh, next month between our uh, two scheduled meetings to take up the uh, four items. Uh, that uh, require public hearings. I'll second it. All in favor. All right, it's 1041 PM meeting adjourned.